We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Welcome into Tailgate. Austin Gill here with Mike Renner in sunny Cincinnati, ready to rip it up after what was a phenomenal Saturday, mm. an absolutely phenomenal Saturday. We took the yes. Miller Lights out, had a nice little day. Some beer Olympics were played, some some flip cups, some beer dye, some beer pong. It was quite the treat, which is a good reminder that this podcast is sponsored by Miller Light. We're running a little promotion, little promotion, cheeky one. If you tweet out and tag, PFF underscore tailgate and Miller Lite with a picture of a Miller Lite. We will be sending draft guides your way. This of could your be a, Miller Lite. You can't just like yeah Google no no Miller no Lite. don't Google search Miller Lite. I need a selfie with this thing or something. I need a selfie or a hand. I, I, I'm gonna be double checking if it's real. But uh, on a scale of one to ten, how was your Saturday? It was fantastic. We actually you missed out. We went to Rosedale afterwards. You left early because that's your mo. It is. But we met some Gators out. Saw some. Some fans of really the out at the bar looking for you. I was you so down bad, dude. No we started drinking at two, and yeah. I did not. I didn't have enough coffee. I, I was like literally just yeah. like sleeping at the bar when you guys were playing cornhole, and I was like, I gotta, I gotta reel it in here. Someone's gotta reel it in. But I did go to sleep at ten thirty and woke up not hungover. Yeah, the early sleep is a cheat code on the day drinking game and the day drinking affairs. Other pieces on the Miller Lite sponsored catch an early buzz. First things first, Schefter tweet. Um, Within the past week, as the draft has drawn closer, multiple teams in the top half of the draft have inquired with others to try to trade back in the first round per sources. So far, the interest in moving back in Thursday's draft has greatly exceeded the interest in moving up. And that's not all that surprising, right? I mean, this is a product of there not being – I mean, right now there is not a quarterback favored to go inside the top ten. You know, Malik Willis is minus 130 to fall outside the top ten. In the mm-hmm. mock draft that I published today that we're going to go over on the Tuesday edition of this podcast, I had the Steelers trading up for Malik Willis at number 11 overall with the Washington Commanders. That's one of the bigger trades I could see happening. But honestly, I think the big, the more likely trades in this draft are going to be in that 28 to 32 range, teams looking to come back in and, and pick up a Desmond Ritter or pick up a, a Matt Corral and, and snag that fifth-year option. I think that's where you'll see more of the trades happen. Yes, this kind of just reiterates what we've been saying all along, that top end talent's lacking, love the depth, and, and that's why people want to move back and say you'll get more picks in this draft because the difference between pick, say, 13 and pick 25 this year, not big, you know, not big at all. I, I don't think there's a massive difference. I don't care – Whose board you have? I don't see a massive difference in this class. And then the pick between 25 and pick like 40. Mm-hmm. Again, there's like not a massive difference. There's a big group of guys who are, I would say, fringe first rounders, like back end of round one type of talents in this draft class. So that's the more you can stack in that area, the better. And so I think that's why you see teams wanting to. But like I said, I don't think there's going to be a lot of trades. I don't think there's going to be a lot of action. A lot of teams are just going to have to stay put because no one's going to. No one's going to want to move up. It's the thing we say every year. It takes two to tango. Easier to say, yeah, trade down and get more value than it actually is to execute in real time. I think that's definitely the case, like I said, in the top half of the draft. Could there be a flurry of trades in the back end? Sure. Like teams looking to come back up for a quarterback. Yes, or yeah, some... like mini posturing yeah. towards the back end because then it, that's where it doesn't cost you as much. Mm-hmm. Like, like to go from 28 to 22, like, um, you know, was that the Brandon IU trade or the Jordan Love trade? It only costs you then like a fourth yep. or like a, a late third, which is – not nearly as much as the top half of the first round trades will cost you. Even going by most trade value charts, when I was putting together my mock draft, to go up from 20 to 11 in trade value to match what you need to get is only the Steelers' second round pick and a future third would get you ahead of the bar. Like it's Once you get outside the top 10, once you're not trading into the top 10, yeah. a lot of those future first round type of trades just don't show up. Right? You're just not going to get those when it's all said and done. The other piece here on the catch and early buzz, I was writing up my mock draft on Saturday and then I finished it up on Sunday. And while I was writing, I was like, 
if I was in a legal betting state, I would be betting Trayvon Walker plus 200 to go number one overall with his maximum bet because it just didn't make sense that he was still two to one to be the number one overall pick with all that I've heard, all the people that I've talked to. Trayvon Walker now, according to DraftKings Sportsbook, and pretty much any sportsbook you can find, is minus 160 or more likely to be the number one overall pick. And Aiden Hutchinson has moved to plus 140. What's more wild about that too is that this morning, Iki was plus 1,400, and now he's down to plus 750. This is how I see it. Well, it's, it is because Balky did say there are four guys he's considered. Yes. So well, there's that's... only three. Only three with under yeah. plus 1,000 odds. Yeah. So Trayvon Walker, minus 160. Aiden Hutchinson, plus 140. This morning, Aquano was plus 1,400. Now he's plus 750. And the way I see it is, Balky loves Trayvon Walker. And people are like, it's the upside. It's the athleticism. Honestly, what a lot of it is, is the arm length which he covets at the position. He's said that multiple times in press conferences. He's done. He's also shown that in the players that he's you know drafted. And then it's also the Harbaugh relationship. That's a, it's, a, it's a mixed bag of both. Doug Peterson, however, wants Iki Aquanu. The coaching staff wants Iki Aquanu to prop up Trevor Lawrence. And then there's evaluators, scouts that want Aiden Hutchinson. I think the other report is that the owner wants Aiden Hutchinson. How I think it will go down. Is Trayvon Walker is their likely selection right now? If the draft started right now, it would be Trayvon Walker. And I think number two behind Walker is not even Hutchinson. I think it's Aquanu. Like, I think Balky's either going to get Walker, the guy he wants, or he's going to give Peterson the guy he wants, which is Icky Aquanu. I honestly don't think Aiden Hutchinson's even number two, given all that I've heard. What would I do? i take Aiden Hutchinson number one overall. He's number one on your board, number one on my board, number one on the media consensus board, and what the owner wants, Shad Khan, in there in Jacksonville. What I think happens, though, is it's, Balky either gets Walker or he gives Peterson a Quanu. I do think that the plus 750 bet for a Quanu is really good value because I think he's highly, highly in consideration. So I've been obviously on Aiden Hutchinson since November. He's the number one player on the board since then. I think December was the first time I put him number one in the mock draft. Has not changed since then. I've been banging home saying it does not make any sense for this team to go anywhere else. Like that, if with the situation Trent Balky is in, having to save his job. It makes no sense to go anywhere else other than the guy who you know, who has the highest floor player in this draft, the guy who can impact your team literally tomorrow, who is NFL about the most NFL-ready player in this draft as well. To me, it does not make any sense to go anywhere other than Aiden Hutchinson for this franchise, for the situation Trent Balky's in. Now, that being said, if Trent Balky also subscribed to that line of thinking, there would not have this conversation right now. Like, there would it would have come out that Aiden Hutchinson's their like that would be the reporting right now is that that's where they're leaning. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're not tells me that it's not going to be in Hutchinson. Because if you, if you believed in that, if that's like how you, if that's how Trent Baalke was thinking, the same line of reasoning that I'm giving here, it wouldn't be a debate. There would be no hemming and hawing on where you go. It would be very obvious, in my opinion, of where to go. So that is why, at this point, since that hasn't been reported at all, since there's literally him saying there's still four guys, this other, like if you actually believe to the last th thinking I'm, I'm outlining here, you, it would be over. There would be no four guys. There would be no debate. It would be completely all in on Ian Hutchinson. So what that tells me and why I, I now have changed my tune is I think it's going to be Trayvon Walker number one overall. I yeah. truly do at this point. As crazy as that sounds, and I know we are still in silly season and maybe I'm getting played here. I do think it's going to be Trayvon Walker. My, my take on the silly season comment, it's like, oh, he's just doing smoke. It's like, what's the, what's the smoke for? But there's like, no reason. Yeah, exactly. There's no reason to at number one overall. You control the draft. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter where. You can lay your cards out wholesale, and it almost helps you to do so if someone wants for like trade purposes yeah. to do so. And he's already playing damage control in that press conference he had yesterday, or I think it was Friday, where he said Aiden Hutchinson's a good football player, but there's a lot of good football players in this draft. And then he said, you know, he brings up that Walker yeah. and how he was used, like didn't cater to being an overly productive player. Like he's already playing damage control in terms of like damage control in that, hey, the consensus right now is that we want Aiden Hutchinson, right? If you had to ask, if you pulled the Jacksonville Jaguars fan base, the leading player of interest would be Aiden Hutchinson. So he's already trying to like kind of convince the media there and convince the players there. I will say this about Trayvon Walker. He's a top 10 player on my board. Number eight overall in this class. I think he is in that tier one among edge defenders with Aiden, with Kayvon Thibodeau. And I think what's being wrongly said about Walker is just like low floor. Like he is an insanely athletic player with ideal measurables for the position that at his worst is 
a very high-end run defender that can play inside outside and like there's a lot of belief that he can add weight or drop weight depending on what you want him to do like he can get up to 280 285 if you want him to he's at 272 right now like this boomer bust type i don't think is how i'd frame walker as a player trayvon walker is easily those inexperienced edge of the top four easily by from just purely from a snaps played standpoint then you factor in how often he's even played outside the tackles and he's played like a third of the career snaps he's inexperienced and that shows up in his pass rushing technique he has not pinned his ears back and 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 had one-on-one situations with offensive tackles nearly as much as these other guys so you're banking on with that attic experience he's going to develop technically as a pass rusher you don't need him to develop you know, athletically, you don't need his arms to get longer. You need him to improve technically as a pass rusher. And it just doesn't make sense for me to prioritize him over an Aiden Hutchinson that's similarly tiered athletically from a measurables perspective with shorter arms that has better production or even Kayvon Thibodeau. The fact that Kayvon Thibodeau is not even in the discussion also kind of blows me away. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the Jags do, but I do think it's in this order right now. Walker, Aquanu. Then Hutchinson. That's why I do feel like there's value on um, Aquano at plus 750. There's value as early as this morning at plus 1400 for the NC State off of the tackle to be a Jacksonville Jaguar. I will say, though, Trayvon Walker going one, it would be unprecedented, at least in my time following the draft. Like the edges in terms of the bet making, making that kind of bet with an number one overall pick. I guess Eric Fisher was a similarly, that's probably your closest corollary. I mean, even he was probably a little more. Pol- pol- like proven at the collegiate level like he played very well at least against lower level competition like Trayvon Walker is still just kind of you're just betting on tools like Mario Williams had something like 14 and a half sacks his final year of college Miles Garrett had over 30 in his career Javon Clowney didn't you know got highly publicized as last year at South Carolina it wasn't great but he had 13 sacks the year prior to that all these edges that have gone first overall like at some point in their collegiate career were dominant or high level producers Trayvon Walker's nine and a half sacks in his entire career. It, it, like, it really will be an unprecedented first overall pick should he go there. At least, like I said, in modern memory, uh, go back, whatever. Maybe there's one that I don't know about, but at least in the past 20 years or so. Wow. We're, we're going to go through your big board versus the athletic consensus board. I think we told the Thursday podcast listeners that we'd be doing this on that Monday podcast. We also have a segment coming up where we do our red star players on the consensus board, guys that we're going to be banging the table for that are outside certain spots like 16, 48, 80, et cetera. Before we get into that, presenting sponsor of this podcast is Cash App. Cash App is the easiest way to send, spend, and save your money. You can send or request money from your friends when they owe you for dinner, drinks, literally anything. Besides just sending money back and forth with Cash App, you can invest stocks in stocks with as little as one dollar as you buy, sell, and send Bitcoin instantly. It's really that easy. Cash App also lets you design your own debit card completely free to spend money anywhere you'd like. Cash App will laser print it and mail it to you all for free. And the card comes with free discounts at your favorite places called Boosts. Sign up for Cash App today. Use referral code HUTCHPOD, which gives you New users, $15, and Cash App will set aside $10 for each sign-up that goes towards the Chad Tuff Foundation to battle pediatric cancer. The more people that use code HUTCHPOD when registering not only get $15 for free, but you're also hoping to support the Chad Tuff Foundation. Download Cash App in the App Store or on Google Play Store today. All right, your big board versus the consensus board. One of the first players that were you know we're going to go through the guys that were higher on significantly compared to the consensus and then some of the guys that were lower on or you're lower on compared to the consensus let's start with the central michigan offensive tackle bernard ryman he is not even a top he's not even in the first round conversation really in any mock draft that you look at he's also outside the top 30 on daniel jeremiah's big board from nfl media and he currently ranks 35th on the media consensus board across the 60 big boards that Arif Hassan of The Athletic has put together. However, for you, you have him as the 18th ranked player in the draft. Big fan. Obviously, no secret about that. The age concerning to a degree, arm length, he's within well within the range of production. To me, I, I, I don't get why he doesn't have more fans, truthfully. <laughs> like, it blows my mind. His tape is exceptional. I mean, he's the second highest graded offense tackle in college football last year. Um, was not as good at the senior bowl as I expected, but he was still probably in the conversation for the best, if not second, at least top three offensive tackle there. I think Abe Lucas probably had the best week of practice. Raymond and Penning probably two and three in some order. But the guy is an elite, elite athlete. I, I really don't get a four three two short shuttle as pro day. That's the fastest <laughs> that's the fastest pro pro day 
offense pro day short shuttle we've seen from offense tackle. Seven three four three cone is pro day. He's like ticks the athletic boxes wholesale. I, I really uh, am surprised that he has lost so much steam in the pre-draft process. There's also, I mean, the bit of a sample size thing, right? Like he doesn't have as many snaps played as some of the other top offensive tackles in this class. And for him, though, I was looking at some of the pressure rate numbers, P- career pressure rate allowed on third and four plus at offensive tackle uh, in this class. Bernard Ryman of the top six offensive tackles ranks first, but he's only got 150 snaps on third and four plus, which is easily the lowest yeah. of the top six at 3.3%. Then it's Evan Neal at 4.3%, Iki Aquano at 4.5%, Tyler Smith of Tulsa at 64 Charles Cross at 65 and then last of the top consensus six offensive tackles is your guy, Trevor Penning, 7.8% on 309 FCS snaps. Not only the most snaps made in those top six offensive tackles, but the worst rate, which the more you look at some of the advanced data around Penning, specifically in pass protection, I am blown away that he's even in consideration. People I've talked to said he's in consideration for the Seahawks at nine. Like, yeah. if the board falls a certain way, I think he, they could be going after Penning as early as nine. For Ryman, I don't have him in my top, I believe, 32 players. I'm a bit lower on him. I do think some of the, the arm length is a bit of a concern. Also, just the experience is a concern despite his age. But I could see myself being wrong there just given you know how much you're high on him and you've had a good track record looking at offensive tackles. Also, I think – You know, the experience we've had talking to Paul Alexander and the guys that are coaching him up, I think there's a lot of people buying him as a, you know, as a guy that's going to be a lot better in the NFL. Next player on the we're higher than them than the media consensus. I think the league's got to catch up here. Sky Moore, Western Michigan. I don't see the concerns in Sky Moore's profile that should keep him out of the first round outside of the fact that he played in the group of five. Really, like he's got arm length I love. 195 pounds is a threshold you like to see him clear. He's got a lot of experience on the outside versus the slot. I think he's a better outside receiver prospect than Jahan Dotson, and Dotson has over 1,200 career snaps played on the outside. The fact that he is the 22nd-ranked player on your board and just 57th on the consensus board, I think is foolish. I, I think Sky Moore is a lot better than that. I think the the, the media is going to be wrong, and if the, the the NFL does not put pick him inside the first 40 picks, I'd be really stunned. Yeah, I, I love – another guy I love his background in that he didn't play wide receiver until he got to Western Michigan – was a quarterback in high school, was recruited as a cornerback at Western Michigan, switched only as a freshman there to go to the offensive side of the ball. And, yeah, he's five, little under 5'10", but 195 pounds. He's bigger than all the other top, you know, Jahan Dotson, Chris Olave, Garrett Wilson, weighs more than all those guys, big hands, no drop issues whatsoever throughout his career. I, I, I think he's going to be a stud. I don't know. That one's – it just seems there were overweighting level competition with him when he dominated like Pittsburgh. He got he was open against Michigan even if it wasn't necessarily productive. The tape was good still against Michigan. The other thing is he came out early, right? So he wasn't eligible yeah. for the Senior Bowl. I yeah. think the Senior Bowl could have vaulted him up a bit more, at least on the media consensus board. I think the league will still be as high on him regardless of whether he went yeah. to the Senior Bowl. But him coming out, and it's similar to the next player we'll talk about, group of five players coming out early – is often an indication of what they're hearing from the committee. The NFL committee that gives out draft grades to help those players make those decisions does not take that role lightly. Like, they will tell agents straight up, even if you think you're a first-rounder, that you're undraftable. And you'll have to, you know, the recommendation is to go back to school. Sky Moore, who we're hiring on, right, 22 versus 57, the receiver from Western Michigan, obviously got that nod from the committee. And then Tyler Smith, who's one of the youngest players in this draft, coming out of Tulsa as a redshirt sophomore, also coming out early, 25th ranked player on PFF's draft board, just 53rd on the consensus ranks. Another guy we're higher on. And he had a 1710 split at 324 pounds. That's nuts. Most big time blocks in the country last year, which are the highest graded blocks in our system. He's just, he's a monster. And, and his technique is just about as raw as can be. Really nothing to speak of in pass protection, which is almost like, it's not a good thing, obviously, but he really, there's no like bad habits to, to clean up because he doesn't have any habits to begin with like he's gonna have to be recoached from the ground up yes flags are an issue 16 penalties last year 13 of them holding going to have to reel that in but he's got physical ability like his physical ability from pure what he can do standpoint is not dissimilar to Iki Kwan. it's really not like they are very similar in terms of just go look at their testing numbers look at their tape look at their that ability is just Tyler Smith went to Tulsa where he probably did not have the best of coaching, whereas Nicky Kwani went to NC State, probably a little better. So 
I, I just think once he gets to the league, get him with a good offensive line coach. You you have Pro Bowl type of potential in this guy. What's the difference between him and Austin Jackson from a profile perspective? Because Austin Jackson was billed as a very young, uber athletic, toolsy offensive tackle that went in the back end of the first, and we were not high on that decision. Mm -hmm. Tyler Smith, blanketed terms, right? It's a young, super athletic offensive tackle prospect that probably is going to could go in the back end of the first. Well, I think you just you see it even in the grading, ninety three point nine run blocking grade for Smith. That means even if he doesn't have the technique to use his hands well he knows how to use his hands he knows how to gain leverage he knows how to do things instinctively that austin jackson straight up did not as a prospect yeah that i remember his grading profile being actually was grading terrible. very poorly despite being this high-end athlete whereas that's still a big part of it is the coordination aspect of are you even capable of implementing technique in, in his last two years at USC, Austin Jackson, uh, the left tackle, he played over 800 snaps, did not clear 70.0 as a run blocker, and did not clear 80.0 as a pass blocker. So the production profile, the grading profile, was not near what Tyler Smith was. And Smith has been one that's improved like every year. Like yes. He had a higher run blocking grade in 2018 than he had in 2019 for Austin Jackson. Yeah. And his, his pass blocking grade did not improve all that significantly from 2018 to 2019. So the production profile is obviously wildly different for – Austin Jackson versus Tyler Smith. All right. UConn defensive tackle Travis Jones. We've been kind of tooting his horn for a long time. The UConn guy who I think we need to talk more about his athletic profile. I was looking at some stuff recently at 325 pounds. His 10-yard split is, like, really, really impressive. And I know Jordan Davis is insane, and we get that. But he is the other nose tackle type to covet in this draft class. And you've mocked him inside the first round. I don't think I've seen a lot of other media outlets do that. But it's another one of those guys, I think I keep saying top 40, like him and Sky Moore, group of five players that I think are getting knocked because they're group of five players. Not because they're terrible athletes, not because their production profiles are bad, but they did not play in the power five. And it's, you know, it's literally, when you look at the historical data, like group of five players are not valued in the first round, period. You know, Green Bay has drafted one and it was Jordan Love over the last like five plus years, whatever it is. Travis Jones, 27th on PFS board, only 42nd on the consensus board. Yeah, I his senior bowl was awesome. Like he truly can win in so many different ways, whether it's, you know, nearly 35 inch arms. He can win with his length. He has big hands. He can win with power. He can win with speed. He can win with get off. And he can also bend too to get back to the quarterback, get back to ball carriers. Versatile, played honestly more three tech than nose tackle at UConn hold up to double teams like there's just a lot to like about him as a defense tackle prospect that it's a weak dt class that you're not getting a nice replacement for travis jones if you're waiting until the third fourth round yeah i think there's a drop off after jones right after davis and jones mm -hmm. there's going to be a drop off and and getting 320 plus pound defensive tackles that can come in and and play as well as jones has at uconn um what, what's a good fit for him at the back end of the first round you've mocked him to the packers a lot but i think that's just you being a homer a little right, bit. what about what about uh Tampa Bay. I would Vita love Bea the Tampa and Travis Bay Jones just eating in the middle. That was one that I think in the NFL Stock Exchange mock draft, they did, right? The, mm -hmm. the Stock Exchange crew, Trev. Uh, Trevor Sikama and Connor Rogers. Connor Rogers did. So that one would be a great fit. You just get two big boys that are, they don't fit the three tech mold necessarily, either of them, but can more than hold their own in such a role, are more than athletic to do that role. And then they add the fact that they're just monsters in run defense if they are playing such a role that I think that's an ideal, ideal fit. I know at the top of this podcast, I called out that I think the Jaguars are thinking Walker, then Aquanu, not even Hutch as the second player on their board. I think I'm going to, people are going to call me a copycat, but Adam Schefter on his podcast just said the same thing. That it's going to be Walker or an offensive tackle. I think they're leaning at Quano. He's minus 175 wow. to be the first offensive tackle off the board. So I do think that's where they're leaning. I mean, you talk to anybody that's close to the Jacksonville Jaguars or anyone that is like close to the situation, they feel very, very similarly. That Bulky wants either Walker because he likes Walker or he wants a Quano because Peterson likes a Quano. You know, the owner, Shad Khan, likes Aiden Hutchinson and probably the consensus among scouts, if you look at any of the data, probably likes Hutchinson. But I think it's ultimately the decision makers, right? It's going to be Bulky and Peterson that are betting their jobs on, you know, what they do here at number one overall. I think Peterson and likes you know, upping the offensive line, whereas uh, Balky thinks that Walker is just like Hall of Fame type of guy. Number 
The next guy on our list that we're higher on, Jalen Petrie, who I think I have even higher than you have him mm. at 31. I think he's inside my top 30, the slot corner safety prospect coming out of Baylor. The consensus rank for him is 55. This is one I'm not super surprised by. You know, it doesn't have like the size that maybe you covet and his you know, athleticism is really good, but it's not, you know, elite tier for someone that is like as light as he is. I think, you know, naturally media is going to be a bit lower on Petrie than we are. Uh, but I see so much value in what he can do immediately as a slot corner. I, you know, highest run defense grade among any cornerback in the country last year and plays the game exactly how I think you have to play the slot corner position in today's NFL. Yeah, this one, I... I, I can't think of necessarily a great reason for him being 55 in the consensus other than he's a slot. And, and like, yeah. that's where he's going to play. That's ideally where he's going to play in the NFL because he's so good. You want him around the line of scrimmage. So either he's a slot or either he's a linebacker or like a dimebacker. You, you really using him as a deep safety, not necessarily what you want, but slot starter in a lot of schemes is almost more valuable in such a role because he allows you to just stay in that nickel defense and, and, legitimately be more impactful in the run game than would like an, your third linebacker be in there in 92.7 run defense grade last year he had 50 total defensive stops he is insane around the line of scrimmage with his nose for the football being able to get off blocks being able to find ball carriers that he's just a damn near sure thing in that regard that a lot of schemes I could see falling in love with this guy and I could see him even sneaking into the first round because of that because of you know um, teams that would covet that there's no another player where there's no real suitable other option that like if you want that in your defense it's him or there's really no one else that can provide that do you like Petrie or Daxton Hill more because Daxton Hill is like that's like scheme dependent that mm -hmm. one that question um if I'm going to be sitting in, you know, state cover three or like a static zone looks like some teams do, give me Petrie. I think you can make far more plays than that. If I'm going to play a lot of man coverage, combo coverages, then give me Daxton Hill. His athleticism is going to play better in something like that. But that, and I think that that's the reason why, that. too, because teams obviously cover covet that man coverage ability. He's yeah. like a near lock to be a first rounder now. I think he's minus 300 to go inside the first round. I think he's going to go in in between the, the 25 and 32 picks. I think Tampa Bay is my favorite fit for him, even though I said that about Travis Jones as well. I think mm -hmm. Tampa Bay can't really go wrong with how the value is stacking up in this draft class. Last on the guys we're higher on than the consensus. There's others, too. I encourage you to go check out PFF's final draft board on PFF.com. You can also check out the athletic consensus board um, on the athletic, obviously. Uh, this is Joshua, Joshua Pascal. I think that's how you pronounce it. The Kentucky Edge Defender rank on PFF's board 44th, consensus rank 83rd. And I know exactly why the media is lower on Pascal. They don't like heavy-handed bullies that play inside outside that aren't elite tier athletes at edge like period like if you are I would push back on him not being an elite tier athlete but continue okay but the guys that have like the insane explosiveness yeah. right what's his well it's yard? just the role he played is not like conducive to looking good wholesale his yeah. 10 split was 157 at 268 no pounds. way it was 157 yeah his 10 split's insane I mean his get off and explosives he had a 37 and a half inch vertical at 268 pounds the guy can wait. I didn't play know that. Explosive. That's why I he's see, like. I see his ten yard split at one six two. A ten yard split's so finicky with like yeah, different how different true. people like track it and stuff. Just because but obviously it's like you, a, you're dealing with a smaller margin of error. A thirty seven and a half inch vertical is just as indicative of explosive. And one hundred twenty three inch broad. That is explosive. Yeah. Oh my he's, gosh! At two sixty eight. Why aren't more people talk? I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't. You don't see that like level of explosiveness sometimes on his tape. But I, I guess it's some of the role that he played in, right? Similar to and maybe playing, Trayvon Walker. He's playing four tech. You know, he's like head up over offensive tackles at 268 pounds. The fact that he earned a 90-point overall grade in such a role is insane in and of itself. And, and so his production as a pass rusher suffered because that's just not a pass rushing role first. And it, it very much is similar to what Trayvon Walker's playing. And in said role, he graded out much, much better than Trayvon Walker. Now, projectable body and projectable traits, obviously in a different tier from a Trayvon Walker, but still pretty damn good. Like I said, 4 5 7 10 splits ain't no joke. So... Yeah, Josh Pascal, uh, I'm a big fan. I, I do think he still can be a little inside-outside versatile. He could be a sub, like your third down interior rusher at the next level. But that's a – and that's a tough – that's a tough ask, too, at that size. That's a unique build. Most 270-pound edges are like 6'4", 6'5", not 6'2", like he is. That's like a Brandon Graham-esque build that, as we've seen, gives 
offensive tackles fits. His production profile isn't that awful, too, when you control for some of these things. If you control for just head up or inside the tackle alignments on third and four plus, 15% to Trayvon Walker, 6%. You know, if you look at with stunts and blitzes removed, 15% to Trayvon Walker's 10%. You look at pass rush win rates um, on just inside the tackle with RPOs, play action, and screens removed, 17% to uh, Walker's, I think, is under 10%. So he is actually, you know, more impressive – in the production profile than Walker is and similar frame. And I like the explosiveness too, going back on it. I don't know why I didn't, why I said he's not an elite tier athlete. Maybe the three cone, which he chose not to run is a little bit worse, but yeah. still the explosiveness, whether it's the one, six, two, or even the one, five, seven that you're charting, nothing's going to hide the 38 inch vertical and 123 inch broad. That's like legit, legit explosiveness for a player that big. That is impressive. I think the leagues could be higher on him than that. Then I think the, I think the, the, the yeah, I bet he goes second round 83rd, I would bet good money he goes higher than that. I mean, uh, Daniel Jeremiah, who obviously builds a lot of his board off his own, but also gets a lot of you know feedback from people within yeah. the league. Josh Pascal is 57th on his board. Mm-hmm. Like he, he, I think he is comfortably a second rounder. Bet on that. I wonder what his pick prop is. Might have to actually bet on that. Before we get to who PFF is lower on than the consensus, going to shout out another sponsor here, Pay the Bills, Simply Safe. What do U.S. News, PC Magazine, and Popular Science have in common? They all have ranked Simply Safe Home Security as the best home security of 2021. In fact, US News just named Simply Safe the best home security of 2022. Simply Safe has freed me of worry when Mike and I are doing the live podcast here and our home is alone just to Riggins. Simply Safe protects your whole home around the clock, 24 7, every door, window, and room. Simply Safe is less than a dollar a day and you can set it up in around 30 minutes. And it's always simple to use. There's never a long term contract. You can even hit it for 60 days risk free to see if you like it. If you don't, send it back free of charge. There's nothing to lose. Simply Safe protects over a million homes in the United States alone. Check it out. You can customize the perfect system for your home in just a few minutes at simplysafe.com slash hutch. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. Go to simplysafe.com slash hutch. All right. Players were lower on. These guys were planting some flags on here. Jermaine Johnson, Florida State Edge. He's the 32nd ranked player on PFS draft board, the 12th ranked player on the consensus board, and also minus money to be a top 10 pick. I mm. think Seattle's looking at him at nine. I think the Jets could consider him at 10, depending yeah. on where they go at four. Jermaine Johnson, we are significantly lower on, 20 spots lower on than the consensus board. Yeah, and it's like, I don't want to trash. He's a 32nd player. I think that's a very good player in the draft. I, I think he uses his hands exceptionally well and gets a good get off and, and like can be a bull rusher at the next level. The only thing I worry about is, like, he was not a consistent bull rusher at the clear level um, to that degree. And he's 23 years old. So I think he's going to be a hard edge setter, day one starter. You're not going to complain about him. But also, I didn't see the high end and the consistent dominance that I would want to see if I'm drafting a guy in the top 10 and 12 picks. Speak more to the age stuff. I saw someone recently say, I think it was our own intern, Connor McQuiston, who said the age should not be a concern with Jermaine Johnson. What's, uh, what's, what's your reaction to that? I think for me, the reason you bring up age is that, okay, if he played last year at 23 years old, mm-hmm. was he absolutely dominant? You know what I mean? Because you're going against a lot of guys that are younger than you, and your body is absolutely thing. more mature. Like, if, you are, if you are older, but you also are unbelievably – like you're the top-end production – well, it's like, okay, yeah, like th- th- then I can get on board with that. But if you're on the older end and your production is meh, like good, not great, which is objectively 82.3 overall grades, good, not great, not snap for snap, killing everybody. Like you go watch him against Nicky Kwanu, you go watch of Zen State, Zach Tom of Wake Forest, and he is not beating those guys consistently whatsoever. It was not close, truthfully. Um, then, then the age matters because – in my opinion, because then that kind of limits your, where's your next step for a guy like that? Yeah. You know, so that's. I, th- I think the age discourse around draft valuation sometimes can get overrated because I think it's wrongly spoken about. I think sometimes it's lazy analysis to say, oh, he's an older player. That's a concern. Like the reason age, like you said, the reason age is a concern is that if you're 23 years old in college and you aren't absolutely dominant, that, that is, you know, when you're going against guys who are significantly younger, you're two, three years younger than you, that's more concerning. I don't yeah. care that you're 23 years old now. Like, it doesn't matter that you're 23, yeah. 24 years old now. It's more that, okay, that's good, knowing that it's more difficult, obviously, the younger you are. It's why breakout age is a thing and all that it's stuff. It's because you'll never have that physical advantage ever again, mm-hmm. you know? 
like you're never going to get to also just like experience advantage yeah. like human life experience advantage yeah. <laughs> like 23 years old and like you could be going against offensive tackles in the acc that are 19 18 yeah. years old but five years older five years more experience and when you look at his pressure rates i know his sack numbers are better they're really somewhat fake when you look at some of the win rate stuff pass rush win rate with stunts and blitzes removed in 2020 alone 13 which is significantly low. You have guys like Karloftis, Hutchinson, Kingsley, and Agbari, Kayvon Thibodeau, Abiketti, and Drake Jackson, all clearing 20%. Then you look at on third and four plus, 17%, which was worse than Josh Pascal, who played significantly harder position to create pressure and win. Then you look at um, you know, just pass rush win rates uh, with stunts, RPOs, and, and play action removed. Tied for 111th in the FBS last year, 18% which is significantly worse than Boye Mafe, Nick Benito, Arnold Abichetti. Again, like the, the, the production for Johnson wasn't good, period. And then he goes to the Senior Bowl, dominates for two days, I, and I don't, he has— well, It was good. It wasn't elite, to say. Yeah, it wasn't, yeah. It wasn't elite. Yeah. But I also would argue it wasn't good. It wasn't good among this class. I mean, when you look at the top edge defenders in this class, he's like second to last or last in pass rush win rate, regardless of how you control for situation. And the Senior Bowl, he was very dominant, obviously, and— was given the advice to not obviously compete in the senior bowl moving after the first two days and he's a really good player top 40 player on my board but i don't see the hype around him being a top 10 pick like i i, I think um the media has vaulted him up boards because of the senior bowl and i don't necessarily think it's uh all that justified um compared to some of the other players in this class especially when you got guys like josh pascal all right Traylon burks you are planning your flag on burks like firmly it's mm -hmm. firmly the flag has been planted you were saying burks stinks essentially Burks is the 46th ranked player on your board. The consensus rank for him is 20th. Why do you hate Burks? We've gone over this like a zillion times, but I, I don't think we have. I think it was on the Sirius show last time we talked about it. But he just not on the pod. I mean, he was a glorified gadget player in that offense. Like he's not did not run a full route tree whatsoever, even close. Is not a particularly high end athlete. Now his I still don't. I still think he has good straight line speed. I, I really don't. I'm not worried too much about his, you know, 40 at the combine. I still think when he's in the open field, he outruns guys. I trust what I see on tape in that regard. But I do also trust that a 7283 cone and a 44 short shuttle, which are 11th percentile and 21st percentile respectively, are probably indicative of whether or not he can run a full route tree or not. Like that, that does not give me hope for a guy learning how to run a blaze out, a dig, stuff that you're going to need to do at the NFL level if you're going to justify getting drafted 20th here as the consensus is ranked and utilized as. That gives me pause when saying I'm going to draft that guy in the first round, you know? Yeah. That's just – that's really all it is. is I think that, the, the best perspectives that have been provided on Burks have not come from evaluators but actually from coaches. If you read the Bruce Feldman article, I think that came out today where he asked a handful of wide receiver coaches or head coaches and, and different coaches about Burks and his usage at Arkansas and how they project him. A lot of them say the same exact things that you said. Didn't run a full route tree at Arkansas. Was used largely as a gadget player. You know, you're not going to ask him to, um, you know, do a lot of things on the outside. I mean, you had, I talked to his head coach and he said, I play him in the slot in the NFL. Like that's his best role. Like I do think that he's been overvalued for, the athletic testing a little bit, at least what we thought we were going to be athletic testing until the combine came a little bit lower than we thought. And then also just like, I think the fantasy community is high on Traylon Burks. I don't well, think yeah, coaches are as high on Burks. Because of the production profile, obviously they, they they very much cover fantasy community. And like the projections are very much based off of like market share, production versus age. And he takes those buckets wholesale. Like they were just pumping him in that offense. But Jim Nagy went on Scott Barrett's podcast, the director of the Senior Bowl, said – He's not a first round caliber player. I, I'm not alone in this saying in having worries about yeah. what Traylon Burks could be at the next level or like the concerns about what he will be at the next level. I also think the change of direction stuff is concerning. You have here in your notes seven two eight three cone eleventh percentile, four four short shuttle, that's twenty first percentile. Yeah, I'd said that. Really. Oh, you did? Sorry. <laughs> uh Penn State wide receiver Jahan Dotson. PFF rank fifty six, consensus rank thirty. How much is this is just the media likes to watch receiver tape more? I don't know. I think that could be a part of it. It could be a part of it. Jahan Dotson. Just to pump receivers up. That, so I, I, I do have a take that wide receivers get pumped up on a lot of uh, people's draft boards because they are easier to evaluate in terms of like you get, you can get highlights of a guy. You can, ba you can base your takes off of stats. You have all these things at your disposal that once you sort of, if it's easier to quantify 
you're more likely to quantify it, more likely to then be high in it yeah. and be more confident in it. I think, again, some of the best conversation around Jahan Dotson, and I, I don't have him as a top 30 player on my board, is best ball skills, maybe the best ball skills in the class. I think him and Pickens have some of the best hands, mm -hmm. attack the ball yeah. the best, um, but projects as a slot in the NFL. You know, light frame. I, you don't love the deep speed, right? I, I think that that's, that's the concern as well. I just don't see him as a legit outside receiver prospect as much as he played outside receiver at Penn State. I think his best fit in the NFL is going to be in the slot. And I don't love where he tiers athletically compared to some of the other top receivers in mm -hmm. this class. I still think he's like comfortably a second round pick and a really good football player, but I'm not buying into him being you know, one of the first or six first six receivers off the board and a first round player when it's all said and done. Yeah. And so I think he's a slot and, and I don't think he's necessarily dynamic enough with the ball in his hands. And, and a lot of that dynamism, I think is going to be, I don't say limited at the NFL level, but like at 178 pounds, those guys have, those guys struggle to break tackles compared to 210, 215 pounders. Once you get to the league in terms of guys who you want playing, from the slot. So over the course of his career, 183 catches, only 21 broken tackles after the catch. And I get that he has some shiftiness to him and whatnot, but not a guy who is going to play through contact after the catch. So a slot that you worry about playing through contact after the catch is just, I'm going to be lower on that guy than that's guy I struggle to call a first round caliber player, like a consensus rank of 30 would suggest. Yeah. I think 56 might be a little bit low. I think I'd have him higher than 56, but I still think that you're right to kind of have him outside the first round versus yeah. the media consensus. Next is Logan Hall. Logan Hall's tough because I thought we'd come out of this draft class higher on him than the media consensus. Mm -hmm. um, but the production at the Senior Bowl wasn't great. Production this past year at Houston wasn't great. He's a 72nd ranked player on PFS draft board and now the consensus ranked 44th player. Defense tackle Logan Hall out of Houston. It, athletic dude, don't get me wrong. 6'6", 283, and I think he went 483 in the 40. But nowhere near athletically like his teammate was last year. That's now named Escape Me, who went in the first round to the Saints. Um, do we know who that is? We, What'd you say? Who's this teammate that went first round to the Saints last year? Oh, Peyton Turner. Peyton Turner. Not as athletic as Peyton Turner. Doesn't have the length that Peyton Turner has. Actually has very short arms for a guy who's six foot six, under 33 inch arms, surprisingly. So he's a tweener that, at that size, that's 6'6, 283, you're an edge. In the NFL, you're not holding up on the interior. That's like a that's a smaller version of Jerry Tillery, and we've seen how Jerry Tillery has held you up. Never on the want to give the guy a Jerry Tillery comp. Exactly. Um, Sixty nine snaps outside though his entire collegiate career. So an edge rusher that's never played on the outside, or a guy who needs to put on about twenty pounds to realistically stay on the interior. That's just that's worrisome to me. That that's a worrisome profile, especially given where he played at Houston. Now. He has been undersized his entire career at Houston, still playing on the inside and still produced. Like he was playing at 255 as a three tech. So it's not really anything new for him to do so and why he probably will stay on the inside. But even still, NFL is a different animal. He's going to have to put on weight. And will he be athletic with 15 more pounds? Can he? That's a TBD, but I'm not, I don't know if I'm taking that guy 44th overall at consensus rank would suggest with that kind of profile from. A small school. I think he does go a lot higher than he probably goes higher than seventy two. Yeah, he yeah. probably goes higher than seventy second. Um, and especially because this DT class is weak, that they're going to move up. Like they're going to mm -hmm. all get pushed up, in my opinion, because of that. Last one here, we'll go over someone you're lower on than the consensus. I'm similarly lower on Christian Watson, North Dakota State wide receiver that blew up the combine, has really good size, but ball skills are the biggest concern for me, and that is evident in the unnamed coaches and any article that has talked about his prospects. His own head coach said he needs to improve and get on the jugs machine. We've all said that. Like, he does not have really good ball skills. And he's also a player that has improved a ton. He was a, you know, a captain there at North Dakota State. And I think you're buying into, you know, high-end work ethic, high-end character, and all that stuff. But mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, ball skills, he's, what, 23 years old? Adding that in the NFL is going to be difficult. And I'm interested to see how, you know, what his route tree looks like. Is it a Metcalf type of route tree, right? Where it's just the vertical stuff. Is yeah. he running more underneath? We'll see. Uh, I, I, I'm not high on him enough to take him in the first round. I've seen that way too many times. Yeah. Day two pick for sure, but first round is where I think it's too rich. And also go back to, I think we talked about the Ben Fennel tweet a while ago on about Drake London, even though, so we talked about this a while ago. Ben Fennel tweeted, 
Between 6'4 and 6'5, 200 pounds and 250 pounds is not a normal wide receiver size for success in the NFL. There's only been one pro bowler in the last 21 years of combine participants that fit that, that size profile. That was A.J. Green. Obviously, Drake London came in heavier than that. I thought he would because he was that size when he was still playing basketball and after COVID, but has the frame to put on more. Christian Watson is 23 years old and fits that size profile. That, that's just – he is – that's a skinny, tall, high-cut wide receiver that it's easy to get your hands on for a cornerback. That's why it's difficult. You better be more physically – you better be stronger than that if you are that height to win the NFL. He and also, I already had concerns about there. his – I already had concerns about his play strength even – with the FCS level competition. I was going to say, he did not, the, he has not been tested in that regard. Yeah. Like he's not been tested against like overly physical, bigger cornerbacks, like NFL size cornerbacks. Yeah. We brought up that the FCS competition, you turn on the Christian Watson tape, looks like high school tape. Then you go even to the senior bowl. He went against a lot of smaller corners. Like a lot of his reps in the one-on-ones were against smaller corners going into the NFL. I think it's going to be a lot different yeah. for Christian Watson. And that adjustment again, Still worth a day two pick. He's too good athletically to be allowed on day three, to let slip till day three. I just don't understand some of the first round buzz around Christian Watson. Yeah. All right. Next drill we want to do. Can we call it a drill? It's more of a segment. We're going to look at players outside the top 16 that we'd bang the table for inside that mark, players outside the top 48. And this is all on the consensus board that we'd bang the table inside that mark. Then players outside the top 80. And then the top one six or no top uh, this then some deeper round ones yeah so this is to take a steal from Daniel Jeremiah and his red star players guys that he said he started this when he was with the Ravens I believe where you put a red star next to a player that you just you want on your team no matter where the round it's not saying this guy's top ten player in the class it's saying you want him on your football team because he's you feel confident he will be a good football player maybe not Pro Bowl or maybe not a Hall of Famer but he's going to be a good football player for your roster. So the exercise, the point of this is to say, you know, you're in the middle of the first round. Who's the guy you're going to get? It's a good football player. Middle of the second round. Who's the guy you're going to get? That's a good football player. Middle of the third round, vice, et cetera, et cetera. So that is what we are doing here. Gotcha. Before we get into that, one more read, one more pay the bills number here. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life is full of twists and turns, stress, changes, grief, moments of growth, and moments where we feel like we need to take a step back. BetterHelp Online Therapy is here for the twists and turns and will assess your needs and can match you with your own licensed professional therapist in less than 48 hours. It's not a crisis line, it's not self-help, it is professional therapy done securely online and the service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your therapist. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches so they make it easy and free to change therapists if needed. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy and financial aid is available. BetterHelp is a great way to show show up for yourself and invest in your well-being because, well, you deserve some inner peace. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Hutch. That's BetterHelp.com, H-E-L-P, and join over 2 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer to tailgate listeners. Get 10% off with your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Hutch. All right. First players outside the top 16 on the athletic consensus board halfway through the first round that you are going to bang the table for your red star player i will kick it off with george Karloftis, the purdue defensive end i I just think if you're after pick 16 he has an insanely high floor with also a fairly high ceiling I, i don't i think that with his production profile with the way he wins with the work ethic the sort of drive just the all around everything about Karloftis is a guy driven to succeed and a guy that I think will be at the very least a quality second con like he's going to get a big second contract in the NFL the edge rushers just do to where yeah George Karloftis I think when you're in the middle of the first round you can sure you can chase a high-end player but you can just also chalk up a W Karloftis is an easy W as an edge rusher Top 10 player on your board, top 10 player on my board. I don't think the gap between him and Hutchinson is as vast as the pick props are, right? Like Hutchinson in consideration for number one overall. Karloftis yeah. is like minus money to be drafted outside the top 20. Yeah, I mean, Carlo- so a year ago, obviously, Hutchinson had the broken leg. But if you thought about them as pro- from a prospect perspective, as after their junior year, it wasn't close. Like Karloftis is a much better prospect after their junior years than Ian Hutchinson was. Obviously, Hutchinson had the massive step four as a senior, but – we have not yet to see what Carl Loftus's step four senior could have been. There you go. I think the, the player I have, and he is, I think, 18th on the athletic consensus board, is Chris Olave. He is my wide receiver two in this class. I am really high on Olave 
And I you talk about a guy that's going to get a second contract, second, third, fourth contract in the NFL. It's Olave. I think he is easily the best route runner in this class. It's a lot of polish, and he can run the full tree. You know, you talk about receivers that, you know, I don't like London running a lot down the field in vertical threats. He's not the speed guy. You know, Burks is a gadget player. I, I really like Chris Olave as running anything you want from any alignment. Uh, one of the, you know, older, sure, but like broke out really early at Ohio State and could have easily come out last year but made the decision to come back and and you know his yards per route run averages may be lower because he's working with Jackson Smith Jigma and Garrett Wilson all that stuff but Chris Olave the fact that he's 18th on the consensus board is really surprising to me I think he's firmly a top half you know player I think he could even be considered you know top 10 on some boards I think Olave is gonna be the guy for me halfway through the first yeah I I like that one too I, I like the concept of Red Star in terms of like give me a football player that you know is going to yep. be good um all right 48 I would have loved to get Jalen Petrie here, but he came in 44th on the consensus board. So fairly close, but have to go later than that. So I'm going to go with Sky Moore at 56. No real explanation necessary. We've talked about it enough at this point, but Sky Moore at 56. If he's there at 56 in the second round, yeah, just let me chalk that up as dub. I think there's a handful of players I wanted to have in consideration here, and I think a lot of them are off-ball linebackers. Like Chad Muma is the mm -hmm. 51st-ranked player on the consensus board, the Wyoming off-ball linebacker. I'd bang the table for him. Uh, Leo Chanel, a guy we talked about a ton on this podcast, that I think we're rightfully higher on than the consensus. I think he's inside your top 32, just 58th. 36th. 36th. Just 58th, <clears throat> just 58th on the consensus board. But the guy I'm going to go with, actually, is a little bit further down. And I'd probably like say like top of the third, right, is where I'm more interested in him. Maybe he's not middle of the second round. But Troy Anderson, Montana State. Already, you know, one of the more productive, productive off-ball linebackers in this class. And he's only played one year of it. He was recruited at Montana State, played linebacker, played running back due to, you know, late season depth chart changes at Montana State. The second year he played quarterback due to late season, you know, preseason depth chart changes, and he finally got to play linebacker. And I think he was the first player to make contact with the ball carrier against run against the run on 20% of his snaps, which is the best of any off-ball linebacker in this class. Like, he is already playing the position at a very high level. He's also an elite-tiered athlete. I think he's too low at 74. And honestly, I think he's going to be in consideration in the second round. Like, I think he is a, the type of linebacker from a traits perspective and trajectory perspective that you have to bet on as early as, you know, midway through the second round. I think he's more. it's more likely he's a third-round type of guy, but I like Anderson a lot. Yeah, he's going second round. I would be floored if he doesn't. That. That's an athletic profile. I mean, the closest athletic comp to him coming out, going, looking like drill by drill, Ryan Shazier, who was wow. top 20 pick. Because Ryan Shazier went like 437 at 240. Like, there's just not a lot of guys that big, that fast, and that all around athletic. Getting some priors confirmed going to Daniel Jeremiah's latest big board, and he has him 54th ahead of Chad Muma. So, probably yeah. going to be a second round pick when it's all said yeah. and done. At a, a, midway through the third, who is your bang the table red star? I went with, and he's 108th on the consensus board, but he will go higher than 108th, and it's Luke Gedecky. Gedecky. Got to, Gedecky, I looked right. up the pronunciation of those guys. Gedecky, which I, still doesn't make sense to me. But the Central Michigan right tackle, I still go back to when I first started watching Bernard Raymond, and I was accidentally watching the right tackle for a little, thinking that was him because he was, I was like, damn, this guy's good. But it turns out it wasn't even Raymond. It, it was Gedecky. He's a monster himself. Gedecky. <laughs> Get a key. God damn it. Um, but yeah, 94.3 run blocking grade last year. Another guy who started a weird ass path. They actually had a really nice article on The Athletic about both Raymond and Get a key. basically profiling their paths to being the best tackle duo in college football last year, which was he started at Wisconsin Stevens Point as a tight end from a tiny ass town in northern Wisconsin. And northern Wisconsin is a lot of small towns, but go to Stevens Point as tight end 7,000 calories a day once he gets to central michigan switches from tight end to offensive tackle gets hurt misses all 2020 comes back this year and an absolute monster i love his balance love his ability to play under control love his play strength um a lot of pancakes on his tape he's to me i i, I texted um owen reese of works one of the scouts for the shrine bowl mm -hmm. saying this guy's he's gonna be tj line i mean like third round fourth round type of guy who just you're going to plug in at guard and never really think too much about it yeah I mean I think the the fact that we haven't also seen him play a lot of reps at the position he'll likely play in the NFL where I think he's going to have more success yeah. guard I, I do think helps his projection for me I, th I think he should come off the board in the third round I think teams are going to get a starter and Luke Gedeke the uh 
Central Michigan offensive tackle slash guard, obviously. I have another offensive lineman here, and it's someone that <clears throat> you turned me on for two. Excuse me? Uh, you, you, I think you highlighted him in one of your articles and said this guy's going to go a lot higher than people think, and it's Zach yeah. Tom, the Wake Forest offensive lineman that likely plays guard in the NFL, but I think could stick it out at tackle. 131st. Play tackle. He's 131st on the consensus board. Zach Tom who has like a really good grading profile. You see here, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, 84.3 PFF grade this past year, over a thousand snaps played. I, I, I am a big fan of Tom's game. I don't know why he's- He's going way higher than 100. Yeah, first. way, I way higher than 131. Uh, I think he's probably gonna go come off the board on day two, especially with yes. you know, how teams value the, the offensive tackle class. He might go in the second round. He's, even just, don't even, throw out the tape entirely. Just his athletic profile is a, will go in day two at the offensive line position. What, what's his face? The uh, Northern Iowa offensive lineman. Spencer Brown? Spencer Brown went day two. As about as un, uh, advanced, un, un technically so like Unpolished? Uh, unpolished. That's the word I was looking for. As unpolished offensive tackle prospect, he went in the second round purely off a of physical profile that Zach Tom is very close to. 447 short shuttle, 7323 cone, 910 broad jump, 33 inch vertical. One six three ten split and four nine four forty yard dash. Every single one of those numbers is over ninetieth percentile for the offensive tackle position. He is a elite athlete. And then again, that's throwing out the tape. He would be a day two pick. He had the highest pass block in grade college football last year. His tape against Jermaine Johnson locked him up. Like he is going to be, like I said, a day two pick. May be a guard for some teams. I think he could stick a tackle. Obviously, a little undersized, three hundred four pounds. Short arms, thirty three and a quarter. Play strength. A touch of an issue, but this guy's his mirroring ability is as good as it gets in the class. Some athletic comps that I like for Tom, and he's got 33 and a quarter inch arms, which are longer than both these guys. But yeah. still, Joel Petonio and then Brady Christensen from a year ago, yeah. where he comes in, he's got 17 10-yard split, 93rd percentile, 33 inch vertical, 93rd percentile, 118 broad, 98th percentile. And then you go to the change of direction, 732 three cone. It's 95th percentile, and then a 447 20-yard shuttle, 92nd percentile. Tom? I just read off all this. I was going back and giving you the percentiles, bro. <laughs> I said they're all above 90th percentile. I think we need to get more specific. On to the guy that we want late round. Late round. All right. My late round, red star. Day three, somewhere in day three, I want Rashad White on my football team. The... Arizona State. I don't understand why your obsession with Rashad White. I don't he like has, that Rashad White nearly as much as you do. He has innate rushing ability. He has that talent, that open field running ability at good size is the other thing. Like a lot of guys have it. Like Jerion Ely has it, but he's 180 pounds. You know, Rashad White is six foot 214, 215 with that just ability to make guys miss in the open field. And then a very high-end all-around athlete that I'm going to bet on. Like, I, I just think that he hasn't been playing a lot of running back. What he has, it has been very, very good this past year at Arizona State. Now, he's on the older side, 20, 23 years old. But this past year at Arizona State, broke 44 tackles on 183 attempts for his career. Averaged 6.3 yards per attempt for Arizona State. I, I just – I want that guy in day three. Like, running backs, I'm not drafting – highly anyone in this class because I, I still think even though I love Brees Hall and Kenneth Walker they're still going to go top of the second round and that's too rich for my blood so at that point I'm waiting day three and I'm drafting Rashad White six foot two fourteen one five nine ten yard split is only 52nd percentile but the jumps both inside the 85th percentile at 38 inches on the vert and 125 inches on the broad I I don't know I'm not as big on Rashad White there are other backs I like on day three uh the 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 late round red star for me is Bo Melton a guy I talked about a bit on this podcast five for 11 189 ran a one five ten yard split which is 88th percentile 434 40 yard dash 94th percentile also an 80th percentile vert I think he is a former four-star recruit from Jersey <clears throat> played at Rutgers even though he had offers from other bigger power five schools and I like him immediately in the slot I, I really like him as a slot player in the NFL one of my favorite slot onlys uh on day three that should be available that's it for that drill slash segment slash project we're gonna get to the fun to read and save your like segment and then an interview with NC State head coach Dave Doran we talk a lot about Ike Kwanu also you you high on Devin Leary yet who the NC State quarterback because he said he might be the best quarterback in the country <laughs> I have not. I have not seen him. Sorry. Turn on the tape for Devin Leary because right. Dave Doran, who you're gonna, if you listen to the interview at the back end of this podcast, is a very serious dude. 
I asked him before we started interviewing, I was like, hey, just to, just to confirm, your last name's Doran, right? And he's like, my last name is Doran. I was like, okay, cool, cool, cool. That's good, that's good. Mm -hmm. And then this guy, like, stone cold says to me, and he's not a bullshitter. You can just tell. He's just, yeah. like, one of those football types. It's like Devin Leary is one of the best quarterbacks, if not the best quarterback in the country. I'm queuing it up for – You're going to have to queue him up. going to have to queue him up because I, I, right I wouldn't take that to my grave. Like, I, I really do feel like he uh, – you know, he encouraged me to watch some film, for sure. Uh, he's really high on Devin Leary. All right, fun to read. First one comes from an intern here at PFF who's getting, I think, ratioed into oblivion for this one. Arjun Menon. This has 133 quote tweets. Dude, it was bad. Rob. I mean, it was fun. Very okay. fun. All right, so he tweets out a graphic that's essentially like a similar curve to Carson Wentz here. Joe Burrow and Carson Wentz cumulative EPA in their first two seasons, which is a similar curve. To what Carson Wentz had, obviously. So he said, Joe Burrow and Carson Wentz, two QBs who excelled in their second years, leading their team to the Super Bowl and producing similar total EPA numbers along the way, playing in an offense where everything went right. Wentz fell off right after that. Who's to say Joe Burrow weren't either? Oh my gosh. There's a lot to unpack. Here. Say say whatever you want about comparing Wentz to Burrow, but just to like randomly call it out, I don't know. I think it's just like so, it's just like assault. It so, looks like assault. So I got a number of things here. One, the curves aren't particularly similar, I'll just say. Like, they don't look that much <laughs> the alike. The total EPA numbers are similar. The curves are not. Like, towards the end, and even towards the end, like, they're not they, – they separate pretty drastically. Um, two, Joe Burrow had an offensive, awful, awful offensive line. Like, it's difficult to say that everything went right there. Three, Carson Wentz literally tore his ACL saying everything went right when it's Carson Wentz tearing his ACL in his second year and then not actually leading his team to the Super Bowl because it was Nick Foles that did that in the Super Bowl like there's just a lot off here that it was a it was a tough take and it is rightfully I, I, getting I just don't know I just don't know why he woke up this is 10 1 a.m. and he just woke up and said I'm gonna choose violence and I'm gonna compare Joe Burrow, I'm gonna compare Joe Burrow to Carson Wentz well, it, it was definitely like, I want to compare Joe Burrow to Carson Wentz and let me find something that looks good enough to do so, you know? This is rough. This is rough. So then what I loved about it, too, is we have a, a graphics guy here at PFF. He's a gra I, that sounds like an, I sound like an asshole. A graphic designer here at PFF. His name's Andrew Russell. He quote tweeted him, and Arjun Menon is a phenomenal kid. I'm not trying to bury on the guy. He quote tweets him with a screenshot of the stable metrics comparing Burrow to Wentz. And Burrow is 97th percentile in every stable metric that PFF looks at at the quarterback position, whereas Wentz, who is 93rd percentile in two of them, is 80th or worse in all the other ones. And the most important one avoids negative plays, which is one that I know Steve highlights a ton. He, you know, Carson Wentz in those two years, 24th percentile. Joe Burrow, 97th percentile. So Andrew Russell from the top rope, graphic designer here at PFF. You love to see it. You love yeah. to see it. Uh, more fun to reads here. This is from... At Ty Hildenbrand. I don't know if I've seen this guy before. He's the host on the Solid Verbal College Football Podcast. Um, he tweets out, yes, yes, super authentic to a screenshot here from ESPN. No coach has come, come through and made a strong impression. No coach has come through and made as strong of an impression as Brian Kelly. Stewart said, comparing him to prior LSU coaches. He has a humility and authenticity. <laughs> when you meet him, you feel like you've known him forever. Come on. So Stewart is the head coach at Arch Manning's high school. And so this is talking about Brian Kelly coming through to um, authenticity. Is, it's it's the authenticity for me. A humility and authenticity that Brian Kelly apparently exudes. That is when he's doing be. fake accents <laughs> and dancing at behind recruits. <laughs> That's just absurd. This is probably the biggest fun to like we've had in a while. I don't know if you've seen this one, Quinn. But this is from PFF College aggregating a nice, nice photo of Baker Mayfield's new statue in Oklahoma. And I don't know what happened here, but this is one of the worst representations of another human being I've ever seen. Go, So, Quinn, there's another photo there, right? One that's a little bit more zoomed in on the guy's face. It looks nothing like him. It, it looks nothing like it him. It looks like the T-1000 in Terminator 2. Yeah, that's who it looks like. That's it's a great, a dead that's a literally for that. great like, comp. It, it's a scary. That's a great comp. It's terrifying. I mean, it's a legitimately terrifying statue. Um, nothing like Baker Mayfield. That one was. The first reply is actually that same thing. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. 
Wow, it looks exactly like him. It really does, <laughs> it's a dude. spitting image of the. It's a spitting Who's that image. Actor? Oh my god, it was yeah. That's that's sensational. Baker has not had the best year. Let's just. Oh say. my gosh, it just keeps going on and on for Baker. Yeah. It literally looks nothing like him. I don't know how you get away with that. Is that not the most important thing when building a statue? Literally get the face right. Yeah. Like literally, like his thighs could be bigger. You could, you could. I would rather see the statue without a foot than have the face, the face that like far that. off. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. And he's just standing next to it. It's just incredible. That is incredible. All right, that is definitely fun to read. Man, that was one of my favorite ones of the year. <clears throat> All right, this one. Okay, we did not include this one. We're not going over this one. You don't want to do the one? It's deleted. Oh, is it deleted? It's deleted. Okay. Well, if you haven't seen it or didn't see it, Will no, Compton. No one needs to see it. No one former needs to Raiders see it. linebacker tweeted out a questionable game that he apparently brought into the Raiders locker room that was. No, he was making. It was an absurd joke. That you made think it was no a joke? Sense. Yeah, I think it was a joke. It was not brought into the Raiders locker room. You're high. All right. Well, if you've seen it, you know what we're talking about. If exactly. you haven't seen it, we probably and shouldn't talk about it. I don't even know why you added it in the fun to read. Because it was absolutely <laughs> hilarious, and you know it. All right. Save your likes. Last thing here, and then we'll get to the Dave Doran interview where he calls Devin Leary the best quarterback in the country. This one, I, I <clears throat> Trevor Sigma is one of my favorite people at PFF. He's also one of my <clears throat> favorite followers on Twitter. Follow him at Tampa Bay Trey. He, however, among all the analysts at PFF, I do think leans heavy into the save your life sphere. And he does this a lot. This one's in a reply. So Derek Clawson says, based Carl Loftus over Johnson take haver. And Tre Trevor Sikkim's reply, which I think is playing into the joke, right? I think a lot of people do this. Is many people forget, but George Carl Loftus is a good football player. 24 likes. People are saving their likes on that, which is fine. That's good. It's good. It's good where it is. But Trevor Sikkim, I do think, can send out like, Tom Brady is goaded with the sauce, and it'll get like 4,000 likes. And that, in my opinion, makes me upset. It makes me upset. All I'm saying is save your likes on Trevor Sigma tweets if, uh, if, they aren't, if they aren't next level. Give them the likes that they deserve. George Karloff is a good football player, only at 24 likes right now. I respect the save your likes piece. All right. That's going to do it for this episode. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get to the Dave Dorn interview. But before we get to that, make sure you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. We're going to do a Monday episode, which we're doing right now. Tuesday episode and Wednesday episode, we're not going to be there Thursday. Prioritizing our energy for the draft show, and then we should have one out Friday morning and Saturday morning yep. recapping day one and day two of the draft, and then we won't have another one until that Monday. We weren't, we're not going to do one Sunday. I think we tried to do that last year, and I, think, I honestly want to kill myself. Yeah. So we're not going to do that this year. That's the update on the schedule, though. Let's get to NC State head coach Dave Dorn. Now we're going to the show is NC State head coach Dave Dorn. Coach, great to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. I want to start with the man, the myth, the legend, the guy that I have had a ton of fun with talking to in this pre-draft process. It's Icky Aquanu, the left tackle there from NC State. Let's start with just what your early impressions were of Aquanu, because he is this now billed as a menacing, nasty run blocker that obviously finished a ton of plays for NC State this past year. But turn back the clocks a little bit for those who you know, um, you know didn't have a chance to have the early impressions with Icky Aquanu. Yeah, well, I mean, great young man, uh, in incredible competitor, you know, state champion wrestler, played both ways on his high school football team and, and didn't just play. He was a dominant player on their D-line, just like he was on their O-line and very well-rounded, you know, um, very humble, you know, uh, gracious, treats people with great respect, great personality, a lot of energy. But not just this year, I think, you know, every year that that kid's played, the game he's been a violent finisher he's very different that way and it's not like he had a good game here or there like he's done this to people for three years at this level I was going back and watching some of his tape from this past season and you mentioned finishing I I have to imagine that the film room after those games you guys are looking at that over and over there's the Mississippi State game that comes to mind where he's like throwing defenders into other defenders and all that stuff what's yeah. what's the what's the post game film room like when you're going over the Aquano tape yeah, it's fun. I mean, our we have a thing we do here on Sundays after games where we hand out awards, and, and one of the awards is the pancake bottle and you know, syrup bottles, and the kids get them, and they get to sign their name on them and put them up on the Wall of Fame, I guess you'd say, at the IHOP here. And so it's, you know, the, the whole line room takes a lot of pride in that. Now it's spread the tight ends, running backs, receivers, you name it. And so it's fun, you know, and we put those clips up on the film and let the whole team watch it and celebrate 
and whether it's Icky or someone else, just demolishing somebody on film. We, we take pride in being physical here at NC State. So it's been a lot of fun. And I'm going to miss watching him in our colors anyway. In, in this pre-draft process, a lot have talked, you know, a lot of people have talked about how much he's improved as well in pass protection. I think his run blocking goes without saying about how dominant he is in that area. But you know, so much of his game this past season, or even over the course of his career at NC State, you've seen his footwork improve and it, it, you know, just his production as a pass protector improve. Have you seen that as well? And what what do you credit that to? Is that you know the offensive line coach? Is it a combination of just him improving as well? What is all you know, goes into that? Well, I think it starts just. You know, the relationship that Icky has with John Garrison, our other line coach, those guys work really closely together. You know, as a program, we take a lot of pride in developing all our players. And, you know, we're very honest with them. We talk to them about where they're weak and where they got to get better. And, and we come up with, you know, instructional plans for them to improve. Uh, Icky's no different, you know. And so he knew from last year to this year, he had to grow a lot as a pass pro guy and he worked really hard. You know, Icky was paving the way for another talented prospect entering the draft coming from NC State. That's Bam Knight. I've also talked to him in this pre-draft process. Super humble dude. He also brings up every time I talk to him. I was also a good kick returner. Don't let that off. You know, he's also <laughs> fantastic on special teams. What was it like working yeah. with him and, and your expectations for him going into the NFL? Yeah, Bam's been a great player and, and you know, he's an All-American kick returner. Uh, has home run speed, uh, but is really hard to tackle. You know, he's got a lot of yards after contact and He's a hard worker. He's, he's a guy that uh, is a great teammate. Um, you know, and I think for Bam, just sometimes I think from the outside in, you see these guys that score all these touchdowns and you don't realize the work that goes into it. You know, he's, he's such a hard worker. He's been through a lot. He can play through pain. Um, really excited, you know, for him. And, and, and again, another guy we're going to miss having here. You know, looking ahead to this upcoming season, um, you know, you obviously have to replace Aquano, you have to replace Knight, but you have a, a centerpiece there in Devin Leary that a lot of people are excited about. How, how impressive you've been with him so far this spring and I guess set the stage for what Devin Leary football is going to look like in 2022. Well, I think Devin's one of the best quarterbacks in college football, if not the best. And, and um, you know, watch him play. It's not just the fact that he doesn't throw interceptions, you know, it's, the fact that he wins games in clutch moments and, and does it a lot. You know, he's a guy in a one possession game you want on your team. It's very, very poised. Uh, has tremendous arm talent, which a lot of players do, but he also protects the team. He understands the value of not turning it over. And he gives his receivers a chance to make plays. He's very accurate and can put the ball in places that the defense can't get to it. So, you know, I expect to see him pick up where he left off. He's very confident. He's a great teammate. He's a hard worker and he's got a lot of skills, man. So, you know, I know biggest thing for us right now is just, you know, getting the chemistry with him and the receivers and him and the running backs, because, you know, we lost both running backs and, and Ameka Amezi in the receiver core. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing I was going to highlight too, and talking to Aquano, talking tonight, and you mentioned Emeka Muzie, you're also going to have to replace, in addition to the talent, right, a lot of that that leadership quality, right, and that culture that I'm sure Aquano was driving and Knight was driving. Who are some of the faces? Is it Leary, right? Is it Leary that's kind of driving and maintaining that finishing yeah. nasty culture? And what does that look like right now? Yeah, I think the O lines had great leadership. You know, Icky's never had to really be a leader per se, he could just go be himself and play with Grant Gibson, our center. It's going to be a three-year captain for us. And Devin Leary, returning captain, uh, Devin Carter, receiver, is, you know, a really good leader. Chris Tootle, tight ends, a really good leader. Uh, so we're not short in that category on offense. It's more about just getting the timing and the chemistry down, you know, with Jordan Houston now running back and, and Demi Sumo running back and Delbert Mems running back instead of Ricky Person and Bam Knight. Mm -hmm. you know. Coach, this has been fantastic. I really appreciate the time, and I'm looking forward to Wolfpack football in 2022. Yeah, thanks for having me. We're excited too, man. Appreciate it. Go Pack.